Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our special conversation with Peabody and Emmy Award winner, Professor Evan Mandry, moderated by our 2009 fellow alum, Natasha Merrill, hosted by Equal Justice Works. My name is Lindy Toombs, and I am the Director for Alumni Relations at Equal Justice Works. I am pleased to introduce to you our speakers this evening. Natasha Merrill is a Senior Counsel at the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund Incorporated, promoting racial justice primarily in the areas of government accountability, political participation, criminal justice, and educational opportunities. Natasha led the team in People First of Alabama versus Merrill, where after a trial, a U.S. District Court ruled that Alabama's restrictive absentee voting rules violated the Voting Rights Act and U.S. Constitution ahead of the 2020 general election. Natasha was also a member of the Buck versus Davis team, which successfully represented Mr. Dwayne Buck in the United States Supreme Court. She co-authored the briefs, briefs that argued Mr. Buck had unconstitutionally been sentenced to death after his own expert witness testified he was more likely to be dangerous because he is Black. Justice John Roberts, writing for the court, held that the law punishes people for what they do, not who they are. Prior to joining LDF, Natasha was a civil rights fellow at Freed, Frank, Harris, Shriver, and Jacobson LLP, and clerked for both U.S. District Court Judge John Gleason and U.S. District Court Judge Robert L. Carter. She has previously worked as an assistant federal public defender at the Capitol Habeas Unit of the Federal Public Defender for the District of Arizona and as an Equal Justice Works Fellow and Staff Attorney at the Gulf Region Advocacy Center. Natasha graduated cum laude from New York University School of Law and with honors from the University of Texas at Austin with a Bachelor of Arts in Government and Spanish. Evan is the author of seven books, including four novels. He is, a co he is the co-creator and executive producer of Artificial, a live interactive series on Twitch for which he won Peabody and Emmy Awards in 2019. A graduate of Harvard College and Harvard Law School, Evan is also a leading expert on the death penalty. His book, A Wild Justice, The Death and Resurrection of Capital Punishment in America, was a New York Times editor's pick, a Kirkus Best Book of 2013, and received honorable mentions for both the ABA Silver Gavel and the ASLW Scribe Awards. A regular contributor to Politico, he is currently working on a book about elite colleges, suburbs, and social mobility. It will be published by the New Press in, 2020, in 2022. Evan is married to Valley Raj Mandari, a socialist. They have three children. Please join me in virtually welcoming Natasha and Evan. Over to you. Thank you so much for that introduction. I was Great, thank you so much. You might be a socialist, but she's definitely a sociologist. <laughs> um, Evan, it's great to be here with you this afternoon. And so I thought we could just jump right in. Um, I think we're here today to mostly talk about one of your seven books, I think I heard Lumvi say, um, A Wild Justice, The Death and Resurrection of Capital Punishment in America. Um, so can you just start us off just telling the audience just a little bit about the book? Um, yeah, about, a little bit about the background. Uh, so the book is the behind the scenes story of the litigation of Furman uh, in the 1972 case that ruled the death penalty is then applied in Georgia unconstitutional and Greg, the 1976 case that more or less reversed it and uh, shaped the contours of the death penalty as practiced in the United States today. It's told from the perspective uh, of the litigants. Um, so I got to interview um, almost all of the leading LDF lawyers, your predecessors from the uh, 60s and 70s, many of whom are titanic figures in legal history, and um, and the law clerks um, who um, were on the court at the time. Most of the justices were dead. I tried to interview Stevens. He wouldn't um, 
speak with me, but um, you know, I obviously benefited from all of the archives. So I think stylistically, it's a bit like the Brethren, which covers some of the time period, um, but it's focused exclusively on capital punishment. I want to hear about uh, these LDF attorneys you interviewed in these um, clerks. But first, can you just tell us kind of what, you know, what interested you about this progression um, from the abolition of the death penalty to its, you know, restoration? What made you interested in writing about that? So uh, your background and mine were vaguely similar, <laughs> um, similar clerkships, um, some similar work experience. I'd worked in private practice and um, I worked for many years pro on a pro bono death penalty case in Alabama, and I genuinely enjoyed it. I don't know what you feel about this. I actually liked the litigation. I found the litigation very interesting. I mean, I didn't like that I was, you know, that I was litigating something that I thought was unethical, um, but I thought the issues were very interesting. I liked trying to, um, you know, it was it, we, we took it to the state habeas stage, so it was in, a, in an effective assistance of counsel claim. I thought it was very interesting how to construct it, and I, I thought the constitutional issues were very interesting. So that was basically when I entered academia, I was a death penalty person, and I just began writing law review articles about the death penalty, um, you know, which 12 people read. Um, and I had a vague sense that there was a story um, with Furman and Greg, and I, um, you know, it's like this with any book, you kind of never know until you start doing it. Um, so I started interviewing people and I got, I, I, I remember I was, I would say to my family or my wife um, that there was like a critical mass I needed for it to be interesting. And I basically got almost everyone that I wanted to speak with. And then I understood that the story was much richer than had been commonly reported. So who, so who was this critical mass? Who were these people that you thought you really had to speak to? So the guy, um, I don't know if you know him. So obviously, you know, Tony Amsterdam. And I did interview Tony Amsterdam. Um, but he wasn't like a principal source for the book. Amsterdam, so Amsterdam was an out was outside. So in case any of you don't know, Tony Amsterdam is Nat Natasha's from NYU. So Amsterdam would have been godlike figure, I presume. Is that fair to say? Yeah. Um, so Amsterdam, I, I would say Amsterdam and Thurgood Marshall are the most significant civil rights litigators of the 20th century. Um, Marshall much more publicly. Amsterdam was public, but then after kind of the mid 80s, much more behind the scenes, but he had his finger on every major death penalty case that went to the Supreme Court. And also, I mean, you may know this, he wrote, since you're a voting rights person, he wrote the decision in Baker versus Carr. Did you know that? Good one, right? Um, I did not know that. Yeah, he's an amazing, amazing person. But he wasn't at LDF. He was at University of Pennsylvania when the when they started in the '60s, and then he was at Stanford um, throughout the when Furman and Greg actually went up to the Supreme Court. And the main person at LDF was a guy named Michael Meltzner. And Michael had written uh, a book, partially a memoir, about litigating about the run up to Furman. Um, he also is a novelist, and I kind of thought to myself, I couldn't do it without him. And at a point where I had done enough research that I felt like I could sit with him and, and be, you know, knowledgeable, I reached out to him and um, I'll say whatever, I, it took me five years to write the book, so probably 12 years later, he's still one of my best friends. He was amazingly generous to me, connected me with all of the living um LDF lawyers, um, helped with Amsterdam. And then after I talked to him, I, I knew that I knew that I had a really, really good story on the LDF side. Um, but so, you would have, I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, just briefly say, I'm sure you know Peggy Davis from NYU. She was an, a wonderful source for the book. Um, and, you know, you need for any good narrative, you need some tension. And um, there was some tension between uh, Peggy Davis and Tony Amsterdam, and and that greatly enriched the book. So, you know, you talked to these figures um, who were involved. I didn't realize Peggy Davis was in, involved, actually. 
And so, so what was the campaign? What was the lead up to Furman? You know, I'm, I'm assuming it's not just, you know, one case and we're going to take it to Supreme Court. What was the strategy that, or the campaign behind it? Right. So I'll tell you two starting points. My book opens with uh, Alan Dershowitz's first day as a, as a clerk to Arthur Goldberg. Dershowitz sets this whole chain of events in motion. And actually, he was a, amazingly generous to me uh, in the course of the book. We can, I, I have, I'm fascinated by him. And I've actually written a very long article about him for Politico. Um, I was, I think I was one of his last defenders. I, he lost me last year, but I hung in there for a long time. Um, so Dershowitz, Dershowitz was a law clerk to a short tenured justice named Arthur Goldberg, who left the court after three years to run for governor of New York. Um, Dershowitz is an Orthodox Jew, Goldberg is an Orthodox Jew, and they were very bound. Judaism plays a very interesting role in this story throughout. A lot of the LDF lawyers were, were Jewish. Um, and Goldberg and, and Dershowitz saw it were very politically uh, in sync. And uh, when Dershowitz started, Goldberg had Dershowitz write a memo about the use of the death penalty um, for rape in the South. And, you know, I'm sure we'll talk about this. It was very clear that it was about racism. And Dershowitz's memo effectively found, or to lead effectively, that the death penalty was only used for rape in the South against Black men. Um, and the other starting point was uh, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund adopted a strategy. They basically tried to create a de facto moratorium, and they did. They said, it's an amazing, it's an amazing story. I mean, just think about it from like a, a litigator standpoint. They succeeded in um, stopping executions in the United States for 10 years just with the volume of legal challenges that they mounted. And their strategy was they believed that if they could create enough of a backlog on death row, and this is back in the day when there were a lot of death sentences, that when they finally got a challenge to the Supreme Court, um, that the justices wouldn't have the stomach to say, okay, now open the floodgates and execute the several thousand people that have queued up on death row. Um, so the, the first several chapters of the story, of the story of, uh, is the story of the moratorium movement. Um, kind of a big moment in the case is the litigation of Witherspoon versus Illinois, which is a case in, about jury instructions, jury impaneling capital juries. Um, and from there, it's kind of clear it's gonna end up, um, it's gonna end up going to the Supreme Court, but you have some changes in personnel. And anyway, I, I, I could say much more about it. There's a lot of odd twists and turns um, along the way. And so, when the when the case got to the Supreme Court, though, Tony Amsterdam, what, was he the main was he the main force, the main driving force behind it? For sure. Um, I mean, you know, I'm not quite as expert on the death penalty in like the 2000s, but um, you know, Amsterdam was pretty much the architect of the abolition strategy through the early 2000s. So he argued all of these, all, all of the cases, and um, he's clearly the dominant force with nobody a close second. And, so, and when they get to the Supreme Court, how central, or is race and race in the death penalty, is that a central issue? Um, or how central is that issue? So, you know, one of many ways in which we have to differentiate between text and subtext. Um, so there's <laughs> what people said and, and what they believed. So there's no doubt on either side um, that LDF's interest in the death penalty, in ending the death penalty, you know, by virtue of its mission, was highly informed by concerns of racism. LDF made a, a decision, a somewhat controversial decision, to extend its representation to white death row prisoners, but they believed that was serving the larger interest of creating this moratorium that was going to help. Uh, and I would say on the Supreme Court, uh, among the justices, the concern with racism was central. Um, you know, I'm sure many of you know that Furman is the most splintered division, splint, splintered decision in Supreme Court history. You have nine separate opinions. It's a 5-4 five, four, five, four decision. Nobody in the uh, 
There are five separate majority opinions. No one in the majority joins anybody else's opinion. There's a very short per curiam opinion, which is basically that the death penalty in pra as practiced in Georgia is unconstitutional. And basically the only justice in the majority who talks extensively about race is, is Bill Douglas. Um, Marshall doesn't, which is very, very interesting. Um, Marshall is actually kind of a moderate on capital punishment. Ma Marshall is much more of a tough on crime uh, guy that he's given credit for. He's obviously deeply concerned about racism. Um, but one quirk I'll just tell you about, some of you may know, but in, in 1970, so, so Furman, ends up, it's this splinter decision, but if you're if you're trying to tease out a core rationale, it, it's basically Potter Stewart's, it's arbitrary and capricious in the same way as being struck by lightning. And if you take a class with me, we'll question whether that metaphor is apt. I don't think it really is, but he's talking much more about the arbitrariness, the concern of arbitrariness as opposed to it's cruel and unusual. Potter Stewart had told his clerks early in the term that he thought the death penalty was um, treated people as a means to an end and, and was therefore categorically unconstitutional. But that's not what he wrote. And he, he didn't write it. Um, he ended up brokering an 11th hour deal with Byron White, who had famously sat on the fence throughout the term. And he said, instead of saying it was, he was facially against the death penalty, he said it was as applied. But the quirk I wanted to say, was that the death penalty had come before the court a year earlier in Legatha versus California. And so this concern with arbitrariness in the death penalty sounds like a 14th Amendment due process consideration. The court had rejected this in Legatha. They granted cert in Furman with the idea of tying up loose ends. When they left for the summer, um, they polled and it was eight to one that the death penalty was going to be upheld as constitutional under the Eighth Amendment. Brennan was the lone dissenter. I have serious doubts that Marshall really would have gone through with that, but that's what he said at the time. Brennan left for the summer thinking it was going to be a lonely dissent. And then that's kind of a big part of the story, how you get from 8-1 against to 5-4 in favor. Um, but, you know, one or two of the key things that happened is, um, you know, is that uh, Hugo Black, Hugo Black, and John Harlan died over that summer, and and that 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 had a significant effect, even though they were replaced by conservative justices. Sorry, I went on too long. Yeah, you, you had mentioned the Splinter decision five four, and how you know it was maybe the most splintered decision ever. You know, I, can you I guess expand upon why none of the justices could write? Could, could join each other on their opinions? What was the, the tension such that they could, none of them could join each other? So that's a great question. Um, there's no specific answer to it. And I mean, you know, I, if you read my book, I spent a lot of time talking about who, uh, I, I think like laws, and when, you know, we go to law school, we read a lot of decisions and cases. And then when you practice as a lawyer, you realize that it has almost nothing to do with that. And it's much more about personalities and politics and um, I think we'd be better served as lawyers if we spent a lot more time studying sociology and negotiation than just reading a bunch of cases. These were very, very, um, you know, these obviously by nature, these are very strong-willed, um, iconoclastic people. Um, Bill Douglas is, so you kind of have to go down the list. Uh, Bill Douglas is kind of one of the most loathsome people you'll ever read about in your life. He's a he's a serial abuser. His clerks detested him. Um, and he's just kind of a smartest guy in the room person. So he's not really interested in conciliating. Brennan is Brennan is a real hero of the story. Brennan is against the death penalty from the time of his appointment to the court, and he remains against it until when he leaves the bench. So he's kind of the clearest let's say, ethical stand against it. I think Marshall's done a bit the most complicated, and I think you know we could hypothesize some about how Marshall constructs what he thinks his obligation is as a black man on the court, how to present himself, but I think it leads him to not saying something that is actually in his gut there. And then the other two, Stewart, so Stewart and White, it's literally an 11th hour decision. Um, White goes to visit Stewart's chambers on, I think it's June 7th, 1972, and the case is basically decided by Monday morning, June 10th, 
And you can go if you ever go to you can go to my website. You can see the yellow legal pad that Stewart wrote the struck by lightning language on. Um, he writes it over the weekend at his home in Chevy Chase, Maryland, and um, he had never said anything like this before. Um, so that rationale is hastily decided, and I just think the others don't agree with that. So that's a simple reason. Mm, question why Stewart and White couldn't get together more, um, but White is truly like somebody who's the smartest guy, like wants to be the smartest guy in the room. So he's he's a very, very difficult person. Um, but um, I'll just say that compromise, you're, you're, you're still, you, you live with that today because of that compromise. That, that sets in motion this kind of, you know, the twin pillars of death penalty jurisprudence, which is treat like cases alike, and then, you know, with Lockett and Woodson, you get to treat individual cases individually. And it's very, very hard to reconcile. So, so with this opinion, with Furman, you know, it, it, it is, and, you know, obviously, correct me, it's an ad, they, they strike it there as applied, right? And so the states are free to come back or to create new death penalty schemes in their states. Um, and so in that, you know, this is like between Furman and Greg, and during that time, states are free to create this, this new scheme. And so I was, I was going to ask you, you know, I think after the Furman decision, somebody, a columnist said that, you know, the death penalty can never survive in the United States. So, so what happened in those right. short years? So they thought, the justices thought it was over. Um, and, uh, you know, Stuart, Potter Stewart was so spectacularly wrong about this twice. Stewart believed in 1967 that Witherspoon was going to be the end of the death penalty. He believed that picking a capital jury would just be too daunting and that basically there was very tepid support for the death penalty and that once they made it more complicated to get a, a death, you know, to death qualify a jury that states would just abandon it. 1972, when he made the deal with White, right, because, you know, if you're going by the text, it's easy enough to imagine how you would comply with that mandate. You could just make the death penalty mandatory, which a dozen states end up doing. But he again thinks that support for the death penalty is so tepid that the states are just looking for an excuse to abandon it. And you know, how could it be that a white man who spent his, uh, you know, his entire life cloistered uh, with, you know, seven other white men, one one man of color, and spent his weekends, you know, at a golf club in Chevy Chase, Maryland, how could he have failed to have his finger on the pulse of American society? It's hard to imagine, but he did not. And, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a spectacularly bad gamble. And then, you know, I love questions like this. Was it worth it? You know, if he had known how it was going to come out, was it worth it? Um, I don't know. So, so during that time period, after this decision, and I didn't, you know, you said they, they thought it was over. Um, I don't know why they would have thought it was over, but they thought it was over. Um, in the states, they go back and find different ways. You know, like you said, some do automatic death sentences, others find, you know, different factors or aggravating factors and things of that nature. Was that, from what you saw, was that a, um, a concerted effort? Were states working together to try to come up with the best plans, or were states just like, Georgia was on its own, said it was going to do it this way. Texas independently said it was going to do it that way. What type of things were going on behind the scenes during those years? Right. So you do have the modest evidence of consultation among the states, but you know, you kind of think of it as a political matter. I mean, we have such a federalist, strong federalist system for better or worse, that it's going to be hard to tie anybody to this. I mean, a couple of things that are out there. One, the Model Penal Code, so Herbert Wexler, who was the author of the Model Penal Code, was personally against the death penalty, but included a death penalty provision in the Model Penal Code as a political compromise. He thought kind of the larger goal of having the Model Penal Code accepted trumped the uh, outweighed, sorry, I'll delete that word, uh, and uh, out outweighed any um, concern with the death penalty. So there was a model out there for states to avail themselves of. Um, you know, the mandatory, there's not a clear, um, it'd be easy to say, oh, you know, the most right-leaning states went with the mandatory approach. I don't think it breaks down that way. Berger in particular, Warren Berger, the Chief Justice, 
had sent a very explicit signal that states should should respond by going the mandatory route. And I don't think, even knowing what I know now, that I would I could have said in 1972 that it was obvious that Woodson would be decided the way it was decided. So Potter Stewart clearly wouldn't like a mandatory death penalty, but I think Byron White, you could have, I think Byron White was 50-50 and, you know, Stevens wasn't on the court yet, so there'd be no way to know what he was going to think. And again, you know, a lot of us have these impressions of people where they ended up at the end of their career, but, you know, Stevens wasn't super left-leaning at the start of his career, as Harry Blackman was not. And Harry Blackman was a dissenter in Furman versus George. So, so after this concerted effort, or maybe not so concerted effort, it goes, I think it's three cases that are consolidated and go up to Greg from three different states, I believe. Is that correct? Yeah, I guess it's, I guess it's well, it's effectively three. I think you have four, right? So it's Greg, it's Roberts versus Louisiana, Woodson versus North Carolina, and Jurek versus Texas. <clears throat> and um, so you have the guided discretion statutes the mandatory and the mandatory statute. So they take a pair of guided discretions and a pair of mandatories. Jurek, sorry. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, you go. No, I was gonna say, I, I think, so the court with Greg allows the death penalty in some of those to go forward and not in the others. And I was just wondering what you thought if, if, if um, well, I guess if you could just explain a little bit about the opinion, obviously, so yep. people know. And, and if you thought there was any way that it could have come out differently. Yeah, well, so back to Peggy Davis. So this is Peggy Davis's point of conflict with Tony Amsterdam. So Davis felt very strongly that Jurek in particular needed his own lawyer, right? So the Texas statute, this Texas statute has been rewritten since then, but the Texas statute at the time asked three qualifying questions for the death penalty. And they're the most minimal conditions imaginable, like whether the person had a, there was a substantial chance of future violence. They were basically questions that everybody would satisfy. So Davis says, oh, we need to have, to re-argue Jurek and say that really Jurek should be decided under Woodson. And that's her point of conflict with Amsterdam. Amsterdam was always in swing for the fences no, it's not that mandatory death penalty is unconstitutional, it's the death penalty is unconstitutional. Um, as for the, the, the kind of split the baby Woodson um, versus Greg, um, there's a, it's kind of, it's amazing that this happens, but I kind of, the way I tell it, I think it's basically true, is there was a lunch at the Monocle, this old restaurant in DC, um, and Stevens, uh, White and Stewart went to lunch and they kind of become known as the Troika on the court for this, in this instance. And they um, they just, you know, they make a Solomonic decision. They, they're they turned off by the mandatory statutes and, um, you know, they kind of say, oh, well, look, they made a meaningful effort to comply. And, you know, maybe we can, if somebody's interested in talking about this, I do think, I'm, I'm in the minority, I don't like the death penalty. But I actually think if the mandate of Furman had been meaningfully enforced, the death penalty would be much less morally repugnant in the United States than it is. So if you had in the United States just a handful of people who were executed, say, for killing cops or uh, acts of terror, right, like Sarnev, well, I don't think that's grossly unreasonable. It's not my thing, <laughs> but... I get it, as opposed to, oh, we're going to randomly select among murderers and pick out the poorest black guys and we're going to execute them. Yeah, that's not really an ethical, that's not really a system that anybody can defend. Yeah, I mean, and that's actually a perfect segue, maybe a little earlier than I expected, to McCleskey, McCleskey v. Kemp. Uh, I wanted us to touch on that. You know, obviously, I know you, you focus a lot on Furman and Greg. Um, but I wanted to focus on McCluskey and, you know, you know, Tony Amsterdam said that was the Dred Scott decision of our time. Um, and the reason I wanted to talk about it is because I think in that case, um, what did you say earlier? Some things are said and unsaid. I think in McCluskey, it was, you know, that that was about race and the criminal justice system and the, and the, the death penalty. So um, I guess at first you could just say a little bit about the case and then we could just talk about how the court 
tries to or attempts to deal with race head on uh, in McCluskey. Right. So, I mean, for my money, McCluskey is the case. And actually, um, I've tried, I, I've done a ton of work on a book about McCluskey, but I actually need access to LDF's archive. And I've been on this for four years now. It's maddening. Um, so, you know, McCluskey almost comes out the other way. So McCluskey is another 5-4 decision. So if any of you don't know, McCluskey is a, it's a statistics-based challenge to the death penalty as practiced again in Georgia. Um, it's based largely, or it's based on a study led by a now deceased law professor from the University of Iowa named David Baldus, and they code all death, potentially death eligible murders in Georgia for I think 234 variables. Actually, the evidence of race, the evidence of race in the death penalty is complicated. So it, it, there, there's this, the Baldus study has been replicated many, many times. The majority of the studies don't find that the race of the defendant is the driving factor. What they find is that the race of the victim, so that people who kill white people are much more likely to receive the death penalty than people who kill black people. So it's a devaluing of black lives. And I think when you dig on that, what it is is about, when you think about the way you know, the media covers murders, well, white person gets murdered, that's gonna be front page news, black person gets murdered, they know, right? in the South in 1980. I, I don't think anybody's losing any sleep over that. And um, so in McCleskey, the court, so Lewis Powell writes the decision and, um, you know, another kind of beat your head against the wall moment in this is Powell basically says at the end of his career that McCleskey is the decision he regrets the most. He retires three years after McCleskey. So it's not like Blackman says 27 years later, oh, I really regret how I voted in Furman. It's basically, you know, Powell is saying, oh, wow, yesterday I really did the wrong thing. Okay, that it's pretty maddening. Um, but I think to your point, Natasha, I mean, what you have in McCluskey is it is, it's there, so it is explicitly a race-based challenge, so there's no talk about that, but what it's really about is race in the criminal justice system in America, right? So I always have a litany that I give on this. You know, racism in the debt capital context is, is complicated because a lot of people, a lot of researchers find a race of victim effect as opposed to a race of defendant effect. There's no such complication in the criminal justice system in America, right? We understand that if you're a person of color, you're more likely to be stopped and frisked, and that is more likely to end in an arrest and more likely to lead to your being charged and less likely to get bail and more likely to get higher charges, more likely to be convicted, less likely to be paroled. I mean, the whole litany of disadvantages uh, of people of color in the capital justice system. So what Powell says, and it's, I mean, you don't have to speculate about it. It's in his margin notes and he says it to his clerk. He's like, how do I write this opinion without condemning the capital criminal justice system in America? That, I don't think you can actually. And um, you know that would have advanced the conversation that we're having today by 30 years, um, and that is a real lost opportunity. I don't think you may hate me for this. I don't think ending the death penalty would have materially changed criminal justice in America. I don't like the death penalty, but the death penalty is a very, very rare event. I mean, you know, even if even if you're sentenced to die, you still only have a one in ten chance of actually getting executed. It just wastes the time of a lot of smart, good people like Natasha who have to dedicate their lives to getting somebody off the death row when they could actually be, you know, dedicating their lives to uh, getting Jim Crow laws thrown out or some other, fighting some other act of oppression. But anyway, I do think McCleskey having a conversation about whether the Equal Protection Clause validates statistical evidence of racism in the criminal justice system and requires that practices, you know, not have disparate race effects, well, that would have had widespread beneficial implications. So it's too bad. Yeah. So the court pretty much says, or I guess recognizes that this study says that there's a racially dispar disproportionate impact, but they go on to say, you know, you haven't shown intent or, you know, purpose in this case um, for this particular, yeah, particular case. And so no equal protection claim. Yeah. Um, and I guess I, my, my question is, you know, there's other areas of law 
where, you know, impact can be sufficient, you know, like certain discrimination in voting, certain discrimination in employment. Why do you think here the court wasn't willing to find a way, <laughs> even if you don't think, uh, even if you do think intent is necessary, why do you think the court, they could have found a way, right, to say impact is sufficient? And this for this purpose for these purposes. Well, why do you, I'm oh, sorry. No, so I was asking why why do you think the court wasn't willing to say impact alone is enough? So when I teach this, actually, I, I say the same thing that you just said, except I'll say, well, those are the only instances in which they'll accept statistical evidence, right? I mean, so the Supreme Court is definitely has a kind of antiquarian view of social science evidence there. They're they're not friendly to it. So that's lurking in the background, right? I don't think they're comfortable with it. But I think it's what I said. I think you could, you know, I, I just don't think there was a way to write the McCluskey decision without opening the floodgates to saying, oh, you think this is bad in the death penalty. Well, look what it is in bail, right? And so instead, they take the position, oh, you need to have a smoking gun in the particular case, you know, which is almost impossible um, to find. I, I always like to tell my, you know, when I teach Batson, I'm always like, well, think about how stupid you'd have to be not to be able to articulate a race neutral justification. And then there is that one case where the prosecutor's like, oh, I struck him because he's black. And you're like, oh, wow, that's that's really not very good lawyering. Um, I, that's what it is. It's it's so, there's nothing to speculate about here. They 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 just don't think uh, that they let's be precise about this. OK. Uh, you know, Rehnquist doesn't give a shit, so he, he's he's not voting for it one way or the other. But the kind of you know more fair-minded people just don't see a way to do it without condemning the entire system and opening the floodgates to tons of litigation, which I think would be good. But so it really is just the fear of too much justice, pretty much the opening the floodgates because. If there's disparate impact, or there is disparate impact in, in the death penalty, there's obviously disparate impact in every touch with the criminal justice system. Um, sure. At least if you're on, that, sorry, can I just say, at least if you're on death row, you have a chance of getting a nice pro bono lawyer like you, like a highly qualified, like Fried Frank will take a case, or to Sherman Sterling, they'll let me take a case. Hey, if you're merely serving eight years in prison, well, it's hard to get a high profile. Uh, you know, law firm to undertake to represent you. Sorry. You'll even see that for life sentences, people who get LWAP, you know, who's gonna, you know, it's hard to, to get representation sometimes for those cases to take it all the way up. Yeah. 100%. Um, so I feel like that is a very sobering kind of note about this court, about this opinion, um, and about what that says about the system, pretty much uh, the recognition that it is having a disproportionate impact, um, but not willing to find any way to address it. Um, and I, I guess I wanted to ask you, you know, you know, what do you think, you know, how has that impacted where we are with the with the death penalty today? You know, is, is there a way, I mean, supposedly they left the door open that you can challenge it, but is there a way that you could track, uh, challenge it uh, systemically and, and maybe move the ball further? So 4.5 years ago to eight years ago, I was writing a lot of yeah. <laughs> mainstream articles and I was asking, what's the right strategy to try to end the death penalty? And you had a genuine debate in the death penalty community. By the way, uh, Stephen Bright and Brian Stevenson are on kind of the other side of this. They, they don't want to bring another facial challenge to the death penalty. But there's some other very smart people who are like trying to make the statistic lay the statistical basis for a Furman claim. So for example, I think in, in California, California is an odd death penalty system, but 91% of murders are potentially death eligible. So what's happened over time is you have this phenomenon of aggravator creep, right? So even if we agree and I, I would say this, killing a police officer, I actually think that's a legitimate aggravated, killing a police officer in the line of duty strikes me as a legitimate aggravating factor. But then you get, oh, well, it should be corrections officers. Oh, don't you care about firefighters? And you're like, whoa, 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 you just made a leap there. Firefighters, sure, they're public servants, but they're not, you know, risking their lives for the point of enforcing the law. It's not like a DA. 
And before you know it, you have lists of 24 to 27 aggravating factors where your victim is very young or victim is very old and you have big aggravating factors like heinous, atrocious, and cruel. And you're just not weeding anybody out. I think if the death penalty, if, if certain states, and actually New Jersey tried to make an effort to have a proportionality project where they actually reviewed the proportionality of sentences, I think there's a way that the death penalty could have been practiced that would be much less morally repugnant than it is. Um, and there's a, you know, many people who are like, we should try to say to the Supreme Court, the states have not met the mandate of Furman, which is to reduce arbitrariness. You know, I stopped writing those articles after, after Merrick Garland. So. Yeah, yeah, that's understood, understood. Um, I think that is all the questions I had for you. And I know we've been talking for about 40 minutes. Um, and I was wondering uh, if Lindy is still with us, if perhaps we should open it up for questions or if we should have any final, final words. I am here. I don't have any questions in the chat, so I'll just open it up for a couple minutes. And if we don't get any questions in a minute, then we can wrap it up. Great, thank you. We'll just wait a moment, see if we, need, we get any questions. Okay, I don't see anything coming in. So uh, with that, I will say thank you all for sharing your insight into what has been happening with our death penalty over the years and, and explaining a little bit more in detail about these cases and how they've been uh, having an impact on society and on, uh, on people of color and more specifically black men in America. And so this was very insightful and we thank you so much for your time, Natasha and Evan. And we hope everyone on the call was able to gain something from this conversation that we hosted today. And we hope to see you all later on at some of our events uh, tomorrow. So thank you everyone. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.